Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe, the conference secretary, also the host of MDPI Open Access webinar, Open for Climate Justice, Pursue Sustainable Development. We would like to thank you all for attending this webinar with us today. And the theme of the uh, Open Access Week has been officially announced as Open for Climate Justice. MDPI is launching two special workshops to encourage scientists to join together, take action, and raise awareness about exchange of funding can be means of climate justice. And we aim to promote connection and collaboration among climate movement researchers and international open community. Sharing knowledge is the human right, and tackling the climate crisis requires rapid exchange of knowledge across geographic, uh, economic, and disciplinary boundary. We will record this lecture with the agreement of the lecturer and deposit them in our online database. We will continue to build this database with brief introductions and summaries of the topics across this fascinating field. And we hope this event is of interest to you and we welcome you to join us is formed again. And today is the first webinar of this series, and we have the honor to invite Professor Roger Jones and Professor Jack um, Ganulis to give us two scientific research presentations about climate justice. They have not only significantly contributed to our journal, but also be recognized for their great achievement in the research field. And we also have Ms. Neda with us today, and she's the publishing manager of the Sustainability Journal, and she will introduce us the insight of open access. And after these three presentations, we encourage all the audience and speakers to join our roundtable session to discuss the topic about open access. And that's enough from me. Let me introduce our first speaker for today. And he is Professor Roger Jones. He's from Institute of Sustainable Industry and the Liverpool City, Victoria University. And his major interest is catchment and integrate on urban water management, climate change risk management, and climate impact assessment and adoption and extra. And right now, let me uh, welcome Professor Roger Jones with us right now. Hello. Hello, Professor Jones. And please start sharing with us. Okay, today, um, and thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I would like to acknowledge um, the Judge Amarong of uh, Australia's First Nations people and uh, acknowledge their elders uh, past and present. And today, I really want to talk about systems thinking. Uh, recording, for, recording in progress. For climate justice, but what I'm going to cover off, because it's such a large subject, is to talk about how climate information is feeding into that and, and some of the limits about how climate change is being modelled and managed, and then to think about the different areas of policy that are fitting into climate justice. It's not something that's talked about very often. It's taken for granted. And uh, I'd like to promote the idea that systems thinking actually needs to start when we're thinking about how climate um, influences climate justice. So there are three key areas of climate policy that, that we hear about. There's mitigation, which is the reduction of greenhouse gases, um, future emissions, impacts and adaptation, and loss and damage. And the third one has come on the agenda more recently with the understanding that there is a recording un stopped. unavoidable loss and damage is already occurring uh, and that it is affecting the most vulnerable. So they've all got different needs. And so when we're thinking about how we use climate and climate change, uh, we need to understand how uh, that can affect uh, those different areas. But then they're poorly recognised at the moment. Um, and in some cases, the information that is being provided um, is not adequate and uh, sometimes incorrect. And so if we look at mitigation, uh, the way that the Climate science is being looked at that is that they've constructed a number of shared socioeconomic pathways into the future that describe different worlds, and they look at how climate will change. That 
provides uh, a number of emissions pathways that are then put into climate models and uh, those climate models are then run to see what climate change may do. And uh, it was this generation of pathways that populated um, the sixth assessment report, which was released last year. And when we're looking at climate justice, it's fair and equitable distribution of responsibility to reduce those emissions. And ideally, the burden should go to those with high historical emissions and the greatest capacity, so developed countries. And developing countries um, have a right to sustainable development to uh, achieve sustainable their own sustainable pathways. And so that immediately brings up, well, what kind of information do we have um, about how climate will change in the future and how is that being managed? And so if we have a look at those pathways, the graph on the left, left shows us um, future emissions in gigatons of CO2, and there are a whole host of um, shared socioeconomic pathways from low emissions, uh, and they tend to have um, high sustainable um, energy and things like that, renewable energy. And then there are high emissions pathways of a world that continues to burn lots of fossil fuels. Those are converted into global mean temperature using uh, complex models, but uh, also simple energy balance models are being used as emulators. So this is a very deterministic system in the sense that um, you can get a reasonably simple transfer uh, function, the relationship between emissions and the change. So that's actually quite straightforward. And then the models themselves um, have a whole range of internal uh, uncertainties, mainly to do with climate feedbacks, which give you a whole range of uncertainties around uh, each, each model projection and uh, that produces and so what the, what they're doing now is that they're running ensembles of these models and looking at the median estimate from those ensembles and the spread around that and some of these ensembles are getting very large up to 100 members and we can also look at reductions in future so what happens uh, if we uh, look at some of the lower emission scenarios, or this experiment here actually stops uh, emissions to see what the Earth system will do. And in that way, um, people are exploring avoiding one and a half, two degrees, or what might happen at four, five, six, seven. So that's the kind of information that's being looked in there. And then we have a number of other models, uh, integrated assessment models and others, which distribute uh, the burden or the balance of, of uh, emissions between different countries. So we can explore what happens if um, the developed world reduces as uh, almost as fast as um, the developed world reduces quickly and, and developing countries can come in with uh, at other stages in the future when they reach certain capacities. But the key thing about this is that it measures climate as a smooth change. So we're very used to seeing these, these graphs with the smooth curves on like the ones I just showed. But we know from going outside and just looking at the weather and from looking at the data that climate is anything but smooth. So that brings us into impacts and adaptation. And of course, when we're looking at uh, the greatest impacts, the greatest impacts are not with the mean change, they tend to be uh, with the changes in extremes and things like that, extreme events, natural disasters and so on. And so within the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, they're, they're still using the same socioeconomic pathways, shared so socioeconomic pathways, and uh, in the sixth assessment report, they put together a list of what they call climate impact drivers. So that's things like um, changes in particular types of so like maximum temperature, extreme temperature, water resources. And so there are a list of about 30 or 40 of those. And then the intention is that to actually take those and to provide information on how they may change in the future to inform uh, people involved in 
impacts and adaptation. On the climate justice side, uh, we have uh, adaptation plans for adaptation finance and repurposing development aid, particularly from fossil fuel based projects uh, into more sustainable projects. But um, as we hear, uh, the uh, adaptation fund is underfinanced. Um, countries aren't putting in enough money, and there's a question about what it's being used for. Uh, and similarly, with repurposing development aid, it isn't moving as quickly. Uh, as, as people would like. So those connections are really not being made. But when we actually have a look at the nature of climate change itself, um, on the top here, we have uh, a line with um, the best fit sort of curve sitting through it. And that's usually how the change is conveyed. But of course, all of the impacts are sitting in these peaks and troughs. And then when we subject this data to uh, statistics that actually look at changes in mean in steady state regimes, we find that uh, climate actually undergoes through uh, a series of shifts. And we've done a lot of work on this and uh, if people want to follow up, I can, I can uh, show them some of that. But essentially what we find is not that climate is changing through uh, these smooth changes, but actually what it's doing is, under, is going through these shifts. And what the shifts do is that they can change risk very rapidly. So um, obviously, uh, if you want to travel up a smooth path, it's much easier than traveling up one, uh, which is certainly not smooth. Uh, it stays stable for a while and then can undergo these very rapid changes. And so then there's a question of, are you prepared for large rapid changes in the future? So it might be that it doesn't matter so much as whether a change within a certain time is 0.5 or 6.6 6 degrees or things like that. But if you know that there's going to be a large change in risk, um, it's actually much better to uh, plan up front for that. Uh, and we've had that confirmed with um, end users, in, impact people, adaptation people in uh, many workshops. And what's actually happened in the history of climate modelling is that the early models were much less complex uh, than what we have today. And the early generation were mixed layer models where they had a simple ocean uh, modelled at about 50 metres depth and uh, simple relationships taking heat deeper. When the coupled at ocean atmosphere models were constructed uh, in the 1990s and from then onwards, what actually happened in those models that regimes became emergent at the same time as ENSO became emergent in these models. And so what we can see in this bottom graph here is that up to 2100, and this is one of the early UK runs, um, it actually goes through a series of shifts. And very few of these trends in there um, are statistically meaningful. So actually most of the change in these is associated with these shifts. And another experiment that we did was that we split, uh, we divided these time series into um, the trend-like components and the shift-like components and we associated those with um, sensitivity, climate sensitivity in the models. And it turns out that the shift component is three times as powerful in explaining climate sensitivity than the trend-like component. And what that tells us is that physically what's going on is that um, large amounts of heat are being emitted from the ocean very quickly. There's an instantaneous feedback in the atmosphere and then the system becomes stable again. So we get these very quick changes in risk. But the current way of looking at attribution of it, attributing change for impacts and adaptation, they either take the difference between model ensembles run with pre-industrial forcing, so say usually about 1850 to 1900, and current or future forcing, depending on the events, and they take the difference between them, the two. And it's all analysed using trends. So any nonlinear behaviour that doesn't fall on a trend is discarded. It's not attributed to climate change. 
it's considered to be random climate variability. So if you're actually looking at that large nonlinear component and you're thinking about, well, where is the justice sitting with that, with those rapid changes, because it's affecting vulnerable people the most, it's being discarded as part of this method because it's not considered as part of the force component. But the previous analysis that I told you about um, is that we're looking at nonlinear responses within the climate system to forcing. Another issue is that global moisture extremes currently are larger and more frequent than projected by the models. So what's happening in these two photographs is happening right now. That's on the left, we've got America's largest river, Mississippi, that's in Memphis. Um, it's a trickle. In other places, it's dried. Uh, in many places, at its, at its driest levels ever. On the right-hand side, that photo was taken yesterday. It's the Murray River, Australia's largest river, and it's at record levels. Um, that town is half, well, not half flooded, but there's a very good chance that half of it will be flooded soon. There are a lot of people putting levees and sandbanks and things up to make sure that it doesn't get flooded. My family farm is half underwater um, in country Victoria. So in, in Europe and America at the moment, we're looking at record droughts. And uh, in Australia and other parts of the world, we're looking at record floods. When we look at changes in fire risk, uh, and um, this is very relevant to uh, all countries with Mediterranean style climates. Um, this is looking at something called forest fire danger index um, over the state of Victoria where, where I live. And if we look at the average change around the years 97, 98, total uh, FFBI went up by 44%. But if we look at the days of most severe fire danger, it went up by over 100%. And so what's happened in Australia, and you would have heard this, is that fire risk over the last 20 years has been extreme. And this level of fire risk is actually much more severe than projected by models. Models don't produce this degree of fire risk until around the end of the century, if they do at all. One of the reasons, oh, and this, this is the Australian median daily uh, forest fire danger index is the red. So that's the whole country. And here is season fire work uh, jolly. And you can see that they both shift around the year 2000 substantially. So what's happened in Australia is not just an Australian phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. And we're looking at a big change in fire danger. Again, it's nonlinear. It's, these go through two sets of regimes, uh, haven't plotted the averages, but they're almost straight lines. One of the reasons for that is there's this horrendous graph uh, here, and all of those colors are average relative, global mean relative humidity out of 32 climate models um, from the CMIP5 archive. And that's showing um, relative humidity from 1861 to 2100. This black line here is a high quality data set put together by the UK Met Office. And what it's showing again is around the year 2000, relative humidity went down substantially. And it's this relative humidity, uh, which is actually fueling a lot of the dryness that's, that's affecting the severity of the fires. Now, only four of those models by 2100 reach that same level that we're at now. So we're seeing in the real world, we're seeing changes, particularly in the moisture spectrum, which are much larger than projected by models. So when we're looking at impacts and adaptation, the take home message for that is to, we should be taking our guide from what's happening in the real world and looking at the models to inform us further. We shouldn't be looking at the models and telling and, and using that to tell us how to interpret the real world and throwing away any information about nonlinear change because it's actually those rapid changes uh, which are caused by the forcing. And so this is where we go and look at loss and damage. And 
So the climate science, as, as I said, is attributed via trend analysis and the difference between two model runs. But when we're looking at loss and damage, of course, that is occurring mainly in developing countries and mainly to the vulnerable. Areas of climate justice that people are talking about are reparation payments, repurposing development aid. Again, there is a big reluctance of developed countries to pay so-called guilt money or whatever it is to developing countries. But and so, and, and the other thing is that a lot of the economic damage models are non-linear. So if you get uh, a small amount of change in climate, you can get a large amount of change in damages. And um, that's mounting up, but it's not being accounted for uh, properly. And so if we look at attributing loss and damage for regime shifts for nonlinear change, because there is this step change between one and the other, this area here, this is all uh, loss and damage due to climate change. This is how we should be attributing it. And it's much larger than you would if you were converting that from a trend uh, into, into gradual change. So we're actually not looking at these in the right way um, because we're using this simple linear model for estimating how climate changes. So the problems with the existing approach are, to, to sort of summarise, there's this single approach to all three areas of climate justice and climate policy mitigation, impacts, adaptation, loss and damage. But they all require different kinds of information to understand exactly what's going on. The climate itself is not something that responds linearly or incrementally to a particular forcing. It's a self-regulating complex system. And it responds to forcing by undergoing a series of regime changes. And we're doing work on uh, the reasons for this. It's very complex, but it means that um, things like nonlinear thermodynamics come into the picture, and there's a big reluctance in the physics community to take that sort of thing seriously. The changes that we're observing can be amplified for extremes and impacts, especially when the responses, the impact responses are nonlinear, which means that the economic costs of impacts and damages are systematically being underestimated. This is a graph that um, was in the fifth assessment report, a, a table. And one of the things it does is to have a look at uh, what happens if we're faced by simple risks, complicated risks, and complex risks. And a simple risk is direct. You've got uh, a hazard, you've got vulnerability, you can look at the outcome. Uh, it's easy to unravel. Complicated risk is more difficult. You might have a noise in the relationship. Um, to manage that kind of process, you need top-down, bottom-up, iterative information, collaborative processes, negotiated and shared ideas, um, negotiated over projects with review and trigger points, and um, a lot of risk is actually constructed that way. When we're dealing with complex risks, there might actually be a lot of disagreement about what the nature of the risk is, what are the values at risk, and that sort of methodology, it's adaptive, ongoing, and systemic. The approach is process-driven uh, rather than theory-driven. Um, the stakeholder strategy is deliberation, creating a shared understanding and ownership of the whole process. Mental models might be initially contested and then negotiated and shared. Same thing with values and outcomes. And monitoring, you make it as real-time as possible so that you can inform yourself and be aware of what's going on. And they are actually very, very different. So this was something that we introduced in um, the impacts and adaptation report in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. I regret to say in the sixth assessment report, they've gone back towards this direction. This hasn't really been included. Um, so it's back to simple approaches. And, and, and so we've actually got a systemic problem with how climate information is being framed and analysed. And it's not fit for purpose for, for things like understanding uh, issues to deal with climate policy and climate justice. So some take-home messages from all of this. I realise it's a lot. Um, 
is that traditional scientific methods are not really suited for understanding emergent properties of the climate system. And I haven't said much about it, but we can say the same thing for social ecological systems are similarly complex. So the relationships between people and nature, which is going to be the topic of the next talk. Um, climate justice with its focus on fairness and equity is a really important part of climate policy and it needs to be addressed systemically. At, at the moment, it almost sits off to one side because um, one, one, one group are demanding one thing and the other group don't want to provide it. It's almost that simple. Economics, which I haven't talked about at all, global economics, it faces exactly the same sets of problems as climate. At the moment, we've got central banks putting up interest rates. That's pretty much the only tool they have. And um, it is really unhelpful for all aspects of funding climate policy, that sort of behaviour. So globally, the economic system is really not responding in the way it needs to, uh, to address climate policy. This comes in from left field, but from our experience, conventional academic publishing has become a gatekeeper for preserving the status quo. Very difficult to get different ideas in. And so the rapid open access publishing that's willing to take intellectual risks, uh, I think we need more than ever. And I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much, Professor Jones. You can stop the sharing right now. And oh, yeah. uh, we have, yeah, we have two questions in the question box uh, right yeah. here. Yeah, the first one is, and the number of flood events in several regions have risen over the recent decade. Is it mainly caused by the extreme weather? Yeah, um, it's attribution is difficult. Um, so you do need to know uh, something about the nature of catchment change over that time. But um, one of the things that's that's done here and in other places is the work on um, engaged or unmodified catchments to use as controls is actually very important. Um, it takes quite a lot of work, but to set that up, you can actually get a better idea of where land use and land use change might be contributing to the problem catchment modification and where climate is contributing. But certainly the evidence from where, 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 we, where we are, we're looking at the droughts being faster and deeper, not always deeper, but some have been. Um, but flash droughts have come into our language. And uh, in Australia at the moment, Southeast Australia, they're looking at the same levels of floods now that we had in 2011. That's just an 11 year space, much bigger than early floods. So again, we're, we're, we're seeing extremes in both directions. All right, thank you. And the second one is, well, developing countries have much more difficulties in tackling the problem of global warming. That's absolutely true. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, one of the key reasons for climate justice. If, if, we, if we look at um, who requires that, it's partly on a national basis, it's developing countries, but we've also got uh, vulnerable groups in developed countries. and. Um, we really need to pay attention to both. And, and this means, I think, that when we're dealing with impacts and adaptation, loss and damage, our best guide is actually what's happening in the real climate. That's what's exhibiting the change. And then we should go to the models to build out our information. We shouldn't be depending on average change out of a set of models to tell us what's going on in the real world. That would be my main message from that. All right, thank you so much. And if our audience have another question, please feel free to, oh, oh we, we're seeing and there's another one. Thanks a lot for presenting very really justified and true picture about complexity and the present approach, but where should we focus as initial step? Sorry, I missed last week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you can check the question box. Uh, it's right down below. Yeah, it's in the Q&A part. Maybe oh. one. Yeah, yeah. Where should we focus in, as an initial step? Uh, it's on the bottom. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I think one of the things that would actually be really good, um, you know, because I'm talking to people who are faced by these impacts all the time, and we tell them about the nonlinear change and everything like that, and they say, 
oh yeah, that fits in with my experience. I can understand that. You know, that's 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 how I see the world changing. And then you've got a particular group of scientists who are saying, no, look at the statistics. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a trend there. So one of the things I think you know from from that kind of messaging is to actually give people the confidence that what they're seeing um, is happening. It is going on. Uh, and if if they feel that they they're going through and experiencing unprecedented levels of risk, and that more action is actually needed to face that, um, I think getting this message out there more firmly so that people can understand it is okay to act. Um, we are doing too little. Uh, we we can do a lot more. Uh, that's very important. We can fix the science eventually. Um, but yeah, I think. Talking to the people who are affected by this, uh, giving them the confidence to act and giving them the resources to act is actually really important. All right, thank you. I thank you so much for your answer. And uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to leave them on the question box. Maybe later we can uh, invite Dr. Jones to answer them again. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Galius, uh, do you have another question? I check you uh, typing me that you want to ask some questions. <laughs> Maybe we can leave this question in the table, uh, in the round table, but uh, just uh, in order to make this uh, interesting for the participants, um, I very much enjoyed the presentation of Professor Jones. And I noticed that um, most of the work for predictions is deterministic. Uh, I mean, uh, all the models, of course, uh, they use equations and the solutions go uh, in a certain path. But uh, do you feel uh, that sometimes this can be uh, become unstable and having some uh, bifurcations, which can be uh, dangerous for the future? What is your feeling um, about it? Completely. So uh, we've done a number of projects on this. Um, the first was a, a decade ago called Valuing Adaptation to Rapid Change, which uh, and bringing systems approaches into things, looking at uh, institutional rules. Um, I have a colleague, uh, Celeste Young, who, is, who uh, has put together what she calls the inside out method. And so the first thing that we will do in an assessment is that we will actually go into a system and we'll talk to people and do some workshops and test things and say, how do you make your decisions? You know, how are you deciding what to do here, what to do there? What do you value the most? If this goes wrong, what would your response be? And so we actually look at the decision-making system they're using, the rules that they're making decisions, and then we figure out what kind of climate information um, might actually be used for that kind of things. Yeah, we, we very much take a different approach, um, which is trying to understand where to being made and it's only then that we'll bring the science or the economic models um, into the picture okay yeah, thank you yeah thank you so much for your answer and thank you asking and we let me introduce uh, our second speaker professor dr jack genius to you and his from department of civil engineering aristotle university of sussex Lockheed. And his interest relies on uh, water management, climate change, and environmental issue and energy use. And right now, uh, could you please share your screen with us right now? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will share the, the screen. And this is the first slide. Uh, my presentation will be a little bit different from uh, the one from uh, Professor Jones. Uh, I wanted to insist on this um, keyword of justice, environmental justice under climate change. What does this mean? Uh, of course, these are the impacts from climate change that can make some, uh, say, create some uh, in, uh, inequalities uh, socially and environmentally. And um, this uh, is, um, say, a general question about the relationship between humans and nature. And I will come back to this um, uh, interaction because uh, if you want to be uh, resilient 
and to make just justice um, totally uh, acceptable, uh, this means that we can um, minimize the impacts from climate change. Of course, justice can be also uh, a problem of regulation and uh, law, the, how uh, lawyers and uh, tribunals can um, make, um, say, fair, uh, fair decisions about, um, say, different, um, uh, say, impacts between uh, poor and uh, rich people. And uh, we can uh, talk about uh, the legal dimension of justice. But uh, environmental justice can be also uh, become fair if we uh, say combat, if you try to assess the climate change, as Professor Jones did it before, and minimize its impacts. So this is a question of how the models um, of interaction between humans and nature can give us a kind of solution. So what are the main challenges? Of course, we live in a period uh, some science call the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is this um, huge variation of uh, different uh, characteristics in uh, the planet, like the temperature. Temperature, of course, is uh, one main, uh, say, um, characteristic, but there are others like the CO2 increase or uh, the impacts in acidity in oceans and so and so. So uh, the blue uh, variations here uh, are the variations the um, uh, planet uh, experiences after, say, uh, the last glaciation period. And this is um, about um, 100,000, uh, 10,000 10, years ago. Uh, and um, we can um, see that uh, it is a period of uh, almost steady uh, temperature. And then what happens after the industrial period with the CO2 increase, uh, this is the huge change of temperature. The glaciers are melting and we have all these impacts. Uh, for example, uh, huge temperatures in summer. Uh, we have uh, the wildfires in the forests, in the Mediterranean. But temperature is not only the effect of increase of uh, some uh, war warming is uh, an instability uh, which uh, creates, uh, for example, in the atmosphere, the change of the precipitation patterns. So we can have water uh, in, the, in one place, uh, a lot of water, a lot of rainfall, floods, and in the same time, nearby, we can have um, uh, droughts, we can have a uh, uh, long time, uh, say, uh, with very reduced precipitation, and this can create uh, water insecurity. Uh, this happened in uh, several parts of the world. This happened in the North Africa region, in the Sahara, where we have uh, all these um, uh, this region which has no precipitation uh, and very, very, very low precipitation. But it happens also actually in um, Northern Europe. Uh, last summer, it was a very dry summer. And uh, there is a more than 20 years or more than uh, 50 years drought in uh, uh, south uh, eastern uh, USA, in Arizona and California, uh, a lot of problems due to this um, uh, temperature increase, but temperature increase is mainly dangerous because of these instabilities. So another challenge is, of course, the overpopulation. We are reaching now uh, about 7 uh, billions of uh, 
inhabitants in Africa, for example, in uh, many parts of the world, overpopulation means uh, more need for energy, uh, more uh, water, uh, and um, this can create also uh, some um, uh, inequalities, uh, inequality be between the, the, the north and the south, between, uh, say, regions, between uh, populations uh, living in the same uh, area. For example, because I'm a more specialist in uh, water resources management, if you take uh, the picture of uh, the Athens metropolitan area, which is, um, uh, say, um, very famous from uh, the past, uh, you have the uh, Acropolis, and uh, at that time, we are talking about uh, uh, five, uh, hundred, uh, five centuries before Christ. Uh, there were some uh, river streams, uh, river streams who disappeared actually because um, of the uh, concentration of a large uh, amount of population. This, uh, for example, Google map shows um, a kind of impermeable, let's say, terrain because of uh, all these uh, streets. They covered the, the streams in order to facilitate uh, the traffic. Uh, and um, not too much water goes underground uh, because before uh, Athens, uh, supply, water supply was from uh, groundwater. Actually, 80% uh, of uh, precipitation goes directly into the sea uh, by uh, surface uh, water, the surface uh, flow. So all this uh, use of land and um, development in cities, but not only, can uh, increase um, environmental uh, problems. And um, for example, uh, in uh, water, uh, we can have uh, water uh, scarcity. We can have all these, um, say, uh, natural disasters, uh, mainly, uh, of course, due to uh, some uh, uh, natural causes, but these natural causes uh, have been accelerated recently because of this phenomenon of climate change. So how we can uh, minimize these impacts, environmental impacts due to climate change and to human activities by looking at the relationship between policy science and governance. Because uh, if you can have a model of use of natural resources without so much um, impacts, then we can reduce also the climate change and we can increase the environmental justice, uh, not by law, but uh, by the facts. So there are three big cycles, the overreaching, uh, say, cycle is the governance. Governance is not the government, of course. Uh, governance is um, the combination of uh, decision making and political, say, influence and uh, all these uh, democratic or non-democratic processes. And this can happen at different levels. For example, the national level is uh, the well-known, we have elections, we have uh, uh, new governments, new ministers. Uh, every prime minister has his own views about uh, the uh, economic, say, uh, increase and uh, development. So the governance is the main factor uh, that influences policy, regulation, this is the red uh, circle, and how you, we use natural resources. Because uh, science, for example, and uh, research and all these um, activities on how to use water, how to use energy, uh, are based on, uh, say, scientific uh, 
results, also some uh, empirical knowledge, of course. And um, this interaction between the way we manage natural resources, and I would refer to water, water resources management, influences the policy because um, the one who drafts a uh, law ask uh, scientific uh, evidence, scientific results, in order to be uh, safe in uh, um, making a new law. And when we are talking about uh, politicians, of course, they have advisors. And advisors, uh, they ask uh, lawyers and scientists uh, how to do with climate change, how to manage uh, water in a river, and all these uh, interactions, which are not clear because there are very, uh, very much socioeconomic uh, interactions, are based in this uh, interaction, which is written in the bottom, between uh, nature and humans. And I will explain what I want to say about this. Of course, for example, if I take the case of uh, water resources management, this holistic approach, this systemic approach, uh, started from the year 2000, uh, 20 years ago. But of course, uh, it was also one uh, of the main elements in um, the Rio Declaration. You uh, were talking about sustainability 30 years ago. So this integrated natural resources management is a kind of state of the art of how uh, humans use natural resources. For example, forestry, water. Here is the example of water. And what, uh, say, engineers or scientists look in this, uh, say, integrated systemic approach is to have Technical safety, if you build a dam, for example, engineers uh, want to be uh, safe, not to have uh, problems with the stability of the dam, technically. Then you want to be ecological correct, not to uh, make uh, a lot of uh, uh, impacts on biodiversity, on uh, ecosystems. And of course, this is uh, something very important. Uh, in all uh, uh, models and ways, policy models we use for environmental, uh, say, <clears throat> natural resources use. But uh, in the same time, we have to think economically because, uh, of course, the economy is important for development and uh, sustainability and social equity. And social equity can be, uh, say, um, become, uh, can be maximized when the impacts of uh, this, say, integrated process of uh, natural resources management becomes, uh, say, uh, on uh, uh, the same uh, level uh, with the nature. I mean, there are the natural laws, for example, the water cycle and the human activity, human activities, how to to use um, uh, groundwater. <clears throat> if you overpump water, then you you modify the uh, water cycle, and if you deplete the aquifer, uh, of course something goes wrong. But all this uh, integrated natural resources management is a kind of Gordian knot. It's, a, it's complex. It's a, a relation between uh, decision-making by governments, uh, scientific results, uh, the population, the users, the stakeholders. It's uh, an important, say, uh, component in uh, this uh, uh, overall uh, systemic, holistic approach. So I think, for example, if you take the integrated water resources management, it's a mess. And uh, 
20 years after the application of this model, which is still considered to be the most advanced, uh, there are uh, some um, uh, mixed results obtained by this, uh, because uh, we have to deal with water security and water security, also, also energy security, See, I mean, uh, this is um, the output when we can fight also extremes like uh, floods and droughts, maybe not 100%, but how to deal, how to, um, say, afford uh, water uh, security and natural uh, resources security in case of uh, uh, some uh, natural disasters. So I think in order to find a kind of advanced equity, uh, we can think about the inequity between nature and humans. Because in this interaction, humans take advantage more than nature. Nature is in a very, uh, say, vulnerable solution. This was not always the case. Historically, for example, nature dominated humans. But uh, with industrial development, uh, the possibility to build uh, the pharaonic uh, dams like uh, the Hoover Dam, uh, where the concrete uh, is um, the same uh, we need in order to have a highway from New York to Los Angeles. You can imagine all this um, uh, mass and volume of concrete. And then this uh, was considered as an achievement. And uh, the engineering, uh, say, uh, uh, the engineers are proud about uh, this, um, uh, say, domination of the river by uh, humans. But what happens today in this same Colorado River there is not enough water to fill up the dam. So the dam is there, uh, the technical, say, achievement is there, but the use of water uh, is not the one we wanted. And this is because of the drought, but the drought is also related to uh, climate change, and climate change is mainly due to uh, humans and how humans interact with nature. So this integrated natural resources management has to be complemented by some components. And I think the main components are not technical because this um, uh, problem is not uh, an engineering problem, the water management or the natural resources management. It's, um, uh, systemic and holistic approach, but the holistic approach must take into account the social dimension. And social dimension is very important. And this is how we can go from the actual model of natural humans interaction with different possibilities. For example, there is one model where nature prevails man. Of course, this was uh, also historically the first uh, interaction when humans were not able to uh, dominate uh, nature. So this is not a model which can be, say, uh, acceptable. This is in the past. But there are some other possibilities. For example, you can have the intersection between uh, humans, humans, they have this uh, cultural dimension, which is different from uh, the natural resources. Is a culture, and culture can generate, uh, say, new uh, achievements, uh, innovation, and so on. So we can think about this interaction between nature and man. But still, this differentiation means that uh, men or humans can. Uh, have uh, some pressures, can uh, have the possibility uh, when they use natural assets 
to create these externalities. Externalities are these negative pressures. And this is also another uh, model of uh, hybridization between natural men. So what I'm uh, saying, um, the results of my research uh, during the last years is to go back to the history and see how we can create a model of cooperation and conflict in the same time between humans and nature, because it's not only cooperation between men and nature that can resolve the problem, because we have all these natural disasters, which means uh, we have conflicts between humans and nature. And if you go to the ancient Athens again, uh, rivers were venerated as gods. So this means that um, it was a respect to uh, natural resources and, uh, for example, covering uh, the rivers in order to have a better, uh, say, uh, human uh, life in the cities. Uh, it's a kind of um, adverse effect between humans and nature. But of course, also rivers can create floods. And this is the example of uh, Hercules, the well-known, uh, say, hero from the antiquity, who was able to master, to uh, win the Achelous River, which, was, which is still a very uh, big river in central uh, Greece, creating a lot of floods. No, I mean, this conflict and cooperation can be uh, put together in a kind of dialectical uh, approach between humans and nature. There is an article here we can maybe go and consult, and also in MDPI there is a paper on this dialectical conflict resolution when we try to put together uh, cooperation and confrontation. Is this possible? Yes, because if you have a, a dam and you build a dam, uh, then you go uh, against the hydraulic law of flow and uh, fishes cannot uh, circulate into the river. But if you build a dam with uh, some um, stairs for the circulation of fishes, then this is the union of two opposites, and uh, this can create the best solution, the harmony. So what are the main messages? Is that um, until now, the this anthropocentric and say um, technical technocratic approach uh, between uh, humans and nature has created a lot of pressures, a lot of impacts, a lot of externalities. So these externalities are uh, the main reason of inequalities inequalities socially between poor and, and rich, but inequalities between nature and humans, between human society and how the planet uh, works. So we have to reconciliate the natural laws, and there is this so, the so-called natural-based solutions. But natural-based solutions doesn't mean that uh, the men or the humans should follow the nature, because nature has his law. But the laws of the nature must be respected uh, when we consider uh, what is um, adverse, like uh, floods, and what is, uh, say, cooperation, and put together what are uh, the opposites, the two opposites. So we want to uh, experiment this uh, model by different case studies. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the time available is uh, uh, enough. Maybe I, I will 
uh, stop here uh, by saying that um, if you take, for example, a community where we have different uh, users of natural resources in energy or in water, then we can first analyze what are the activities of these uh, stakeholders, water users, for example, against the natural laws. And then involving stakeholders in the process of management, try to harmonize the human activities, pumping groundwater, using the water from the river, in a way that this use is in harmony with nature. And this is not easy, of course, but uh, this can be possible in order to have a kind of uh, equity, equity between uh, social uh, human activities and uh, the planet, and uh, equity uh, between different uh, social holders living in the same, uh, say, society. Thank you very much, and maybe during the discussion we will have time to uh, respond and to analyze better all these questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ganyanis. Uh, could you please stop the sharing with us? Yeah, we have several questions on the question box. Maybe you can check it. It's in the Q&A part. Yeah, the first one is about human activities. The human activities always influence environmental issue. We usually consider them about the bad side. Can I ask if there is any benefits from human activities? Of course, there are uh, also positive effects and uh, uh, negative effects. But uh, what is uh, the situation is uh, the overall, uh, say, uh, pressure, uh, which is the negative one. I mean, uh, we can, of course, uh, increase the forestation. We can um, uh, clean up the water by wastewater treatment station. But doing all this, by the end, we have a result. And uh, this is negative. I'm sorry that... Uh, I'm uh, not uh, in a position to show that overall uh, human activities benefit to uh, the planet. Uh, of course, uh, this is a hope that uh, with innovation and uh, technical, say, progress, we can do better. But, you know, all these tools uh, are helpful but they are not the solution because the solution is the overall, uh, say, environment, uh, the overall model, how you use the technical, say, achievements and innovation. Because innovation can, uh, say, improve, but can be also uh, not so, uh, say, uh, positive. All right, thank you. Uh, can we move on to the second one? That is true that water insecure problems such as flood and water shortage will sometimes happen in the same area. Yes, well, in the same area, uh, maybe uh, close uh, areas, because we cannot have in the same time uh, huge precipitation and drought, but we can have in few kilometers apart uh, floods and droughts. And this is not uh, a scientific, say, uh, result. This is the common, uh, say, logic. I mean, the experience we can get uh, recently. All right, thank you. And, last last and uh, okay, and let's move on to the next one. Uh, competition over natural resources, including land, forest, water, are there a major drive of the conflict? Well, I will say uh, the main driver is water, because uh, water is the source of life, 
uh, for humans and ecosystems and also for all uh, uh, forests and, uh, say, uh, vegetation, uh, all uh, terrestrial and uh, water ecosystems. So uh, <clears throat> if we resolve the competition over water, uh, I think this is the catalyst to have solutions also to other natural resources. All right, thank you. And uh, we have another one, and I think it's from Dr. Muhammad Bakr. Uh, we have future prediction now, and another framework and extra. And the question is, how are we going to communicate those to the public and enhance the behavior change and promote more resilience? Well, this is a big uh, open question, and of course, open, uh, say, uh, thinking and open uh, communication is one of the solutions. How to communicate? To communicate without any restriction. Uh, of course, we need uh, some uh, communicators. And UN, for example, uh, related institutions are uh, doing uh, a good job. But still, there is an effort to find the ways to communicate, uh, say, um, efficiently, because uh, there are a lot of uh, information in the media, in the social media also, which are not, uh, say, uh, according to the scientific results. And um, yes, uh, open, uh, say, communication, open source communication is one of the main elements that can facilitate this uh, knowledge and this uh, comprehensive this um, diffusion of uh, knowledge. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Galeas. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. And I think our final one is for Professor Jones. He said, hello, Professor Jones. I have a question. If it is still OK, you talk about system thinking. Can we define that people with system thinking will be more likely to care about global issue? That's a really good question. I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. I, th I think, you know, systems thinking is a way of thinking. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll run across particular personalities and you'll think, well, they think in a particular linear way. You know, they, they, they like it simple. They like cause and effect and everything like that. I don't think that has a bearing on values. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that have bearing on values and, and what have you. And the other thing is that, um, to deal with these sorts of issues, we need uh, diversity of thoughts and approaches and things like that. We need systems understanding if we're dealing with complex systems. There's, there's no way around that. We need to be dealing with emergence. Um, there are certain techniques you can and can't use. But in terms of um, putting ideas together, thoughts, different people, uh, when you're building a diverse team, some people are happy in the back room with their computers and they're very good at it. Other people are happy in front of a group of people. And um, so you need all of those. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, answer. And right now we have our final presentation is from uh, Ms. Neda Niklic. And let me introduce Ms. Neda Niklic first. And she's our publishing manager from uh, Journal Sustainability. And Ms. Neda graduated from University of Berglad with a master degree in environmental protection. And right now she works as publishing manager of Journal Sustainability, Sustainable Chemistry and Word. Hello, Neda. Uh, could you please uh, share your screen with us? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Chloe. Uh, I want to lose the time, so I will share the, my presentation right now. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see it? Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, regarding the content today, I will be talking about the definition of open access, uh, shortly about the region of open access, uh, the advantages of open access, and uh, at the end, we'll try to give some uh, brief overview of the, the MDPI uh, doing the open access. 
Uh, okay, so we have a bunch of definitions of open access, and we choose uh, we choose the one from the Berlin Declaration on Open Access uh, to Knowledge uh, to Knowledge in the Science and Humanities. And uh, I apologize, I have some problem with the slideshow. Uh, and uh, or maybe I should go just out this way. Okay. Uh, so by the open access to the literature, we means uh, it's free, it's free availability on the public internet, permitting any uses to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, or link to the full text of these articles, crawl them for indexing, pass them as data to software, or use them for any other lawful purpose without financial, legal, or technical barriers. Uh, Okay, so within the open access, we have a few models. So there's the two main uh, open access models. Uh, first one is the golden open access model, what means that all uh, manuscripts published in open access journals or open access, access options in subscription journals uh, belong to golden open access. And to the other side, we have green open access, uh, what means self-achieving embargo embargo time within these uh, manuscripts. So the open access is free, immediate, permanent online access to the full text of the research articles for everyone uh, web-wide. Okay, so when we talk about the regions of open access, uh, we use this, this scale from 1991 to 2024. Uh, and when we go back to 1991, we have uh, the archive preprint server launched by the scientists, physicists, different physicists, mathematicians, uh, computer scientists who put out their work before the peer review and decided uh, to make it visible to everyone. Uh, 1996, we have MDPI launches its first open access uh, journal. The uh, following year, the PubMed did uh, the same. Uh, 2021 plus plus one did the same. Uh, in 2002, we have the Budapest Open Access Initiative. Then we have 2003 uh, Berlin Declaration Open Access, and it's usually taken as a milestone for the development of the of this uh, moment. Uh, 2003 we have the OAG launched. Uh, 2004, Springer introduced the hybrid model, so the open choice. Uh, 2005, we have welcomed uh, the trust open access policy. 2008, uh, NIJ open access policy, United States was uh, established. Uh, 2012, uh, we have the Finch report, United Kingdom. Uh, 2013, RC UK open, uh, open access policy in United Kingdom as well. Uh, 2013 Horizon 2020 announced uh, the open access. Uh, then but what is very important for this moment is 2018, where the coalition S launched the plan, uh, plan S. Uh, 2018, uh, welcome trust straightens open the yeah. open policy. 2021, we have the plan S mandates came into the force. Uh, 2021 United Kingdom Research and Innovations Update Open Access Policy, and uh, for 2024 we have scheduled United Kingdom uh, Research and Innovation will implement Open Access uh, Policy for monographs. Uh, okay, so in general, when we talked about open access, first of all, it means the free readership. So anyone can research and access the manuscripts published in open access. Uh, the second feature, what is very important is the open licensing. So the copy uh, or the copyright transfer. Uh, the third feature will be uh, redistribution and reuse. So anyone can quote and use uh, the content of those manuscripts and uh, at the end modification. So anyone can change, update and republish uh, this content. Uh, what I mentioned before, we have these two main uh, open access models. So it's the gold one and uh, the green one. And besides those, we have the bronze, diamond and platinum and uh, the black model. Uh, so what is important for the globe, uh, gold open access model is that 
all those manus manuscripts published are freely available immediately on the journal or on the or the web uh, publishers uh, website authors has to pay the uh, article processing charge so it's sometimes referred to authors pay models all the articles are last licensed for sharing and reuse via creative commons license so a famous as ccby uh, license uh copyright is uh, taken by the author so authors retained uh the copyright permission and uh, the researchers can publish their work through fully open access journals or choosing the hybrid models. So the journals that has the on one side their subscription journals, but has this open uh, access uh, opportunities. Uh, then the green model that's self archiving, uh, where the author's version of an accepted manuscript is deposited. Uh, into a subject or institutional uh, repository, making it freely accessible for everyone. Uh, different with the gold one is that this manuscripts usually has this embargo period from 12 to 24 uh, months, but sometimes uh, there is zero embargo uh, on these manuscripts and uh, publishers often uh, require that work is deposited under a creative uh, commons attribution, non-commercial uh, license. Uh, bronze uh, model, its uh, version of the manuscripts is available online on the publisher website, but not under uh, open license that permits sharing or use, and the publisher is able to withdraw the manuscripts anytime. Uh, the diamond and platinum is similar to gold one, and uh, these journals are usually sponsored by association and institution and authors do not pay APC. Uh, Diamond journals also have no fees and uh, they're all based on voluntary uh, contribution. And uh, when we talk about the black models, open access black models, these are the illegals. So they uh, uh, provide the access to subscription, so to paywall content. And uh, in this case, there's no option to reuse and uh, uh, this this model is not openly licensed. Uh, okay, so the plan uh, the plan S very important uh, initiative for making uh, full and immediate open access reality. Uh, this is an uh, initiative published in 2018, and uh, this plan is supported by Coalition S. So it's international consortium of research uh, funding and performing organizations, and uh, Plan S requires that from from 2021, scientific publications that result from research funded by public grants must be published uh, in complaint open access journals platforms. So these are the 10 principles to ensure that all scholarly publications arising from public, public and private grants are published in fully open access. So the research results are a public, uh, public good and should be immediately available to accelerate the science. Uh, no more paywall publications, no hybrid model either. Uh, open access must be immediate, no embargo uh, in compared to subscription journals. Uh, publication under CCBY license, so the authors retain <coughs> the, the, the license. Uh, pricing should be fully transparent. Uh, funders commit to support publications fees and access research outputs according to intrinsic uh, merit. Uh, so today's quality journals are open, reusable, sustainable, and it tends to be that way. So transform the core of the to today's scholarly journals from subscription to open access publishing in accordance with community-specific publication preferences. Uh, pursue this transformation process by converting resources currently spent on journal su subscriptions into funds to uh, support sustainable open access models, and uh, at the end, engage all parties involved in scholarly publishing. So, in particular, universities, research institutions, funders, libraries, and uh, make them all work together and make it uh, real. So, <clears throat> here we just put. The, the statement from the 14 billion open access conferences uh, and in general is stated that publishers are expected to work with all members of the global research community to affect complete and immediate open access according to these uh, statements. 
uh, here on this graphic, we can see the growth uh, of, of open access uh, model. Uh, you can follow the orange line, uh, what is the open access, the blue one shows the closed, so subscription-based uh, journals. And we can see the from 2012 to 2020, uh, the steady growth of uh, open access uh, journals. And uh, uh, also we can follow the fall uh, of the journal, not just open access, but close one and add any other publication model. Uh, I will say probably it's happened due to uh, the, the worldwide conditions due to virus and uh, the crisis. Okay, so when we talk about the future, seeing the future uh, mandates, that national funder mandates will continue <clears throat> to accelerate the transition to open access. Uh, sustainability, all stakeholders need to work together to ensure a sustainable transition, what is necessary. Uh, open is about much more than open access. So how can we make the broader research workflow more open? And uh, regarding the open infrastructure, it's crucial that the right infrastructure is developed to support open research practice. Uh, so when we talk the advantages, uh, about the advantages of open access, uh, first of all, the most important is a much wider range of readers than uh, it was previously possible. Uh, the following adventure, uh, advantage is the equal access to the same information. So everybody in a scholarly world or non-scholarly world has the same uh, the same uh, opportunity to access the, the information. And uh, of course, uh, at the end, all those information accessed uh, can be used quickly and efficiently. And that way it ultimately helping to accelerate the pace of sustainable or scientific research. Uh, okay, the further advantages of open access uh, is uh, Definitely authors retain this copyright, what is very important for the authors. Uh, unlimited distribution, potentially more citation in this way. Uh, developing countries rarely have access to many subscription journals. So this way uh, we open access to platforms. It should be, it, it's actually accessible to everyone worldwide. Uh, also very few institutions have access to all subscription journals. So. Uh, through open access platforms, the hospital, government agencies, private doctors can uh, uh, access all the, the new informations and research. Uh, and uh, this way we can avoid duplicate studies and of course, uh, fast, fast publishing. So when we do comparison of open access and subscriptions, which is the, let's, let's compare the three, uh, three uh, states. So, the first, all articles are available online and freely accessible to readers in open access model. In compared to subscriptions where the articles are available to scholars if the university has purchased a subscription. Uh, the second one will be the all articles are published under CCBY license in open access. Uh, in compared to subscriptions where the all articles are published under constraining copyright uh, copyright license transferred to the publisher. Uh, third one will be that editorial work supported by financially by article processing charges paid by the authors or the institution. And to the other side, uh, in subscription journals, we have authors often pay to additional color or page charges. Uh, furthermore, the importance for researchers to publish in open access will be to retain the right to freely share and reuse their research as they wish, achieve maximum visibility of their outputs. Uh, furthermore, they will publish in the journal of their cho choice, participating in the publishing service if they want. Uh, furthermore, the researcher can gain immediate, free and unrestricted access to all of the latest peer-reviewed research uh, and in the end, support open access and open science with no need to alter the research and publication practice. Uh, here we can see uh, that according to scientific research, uh, we have this uh, 
such a rise of more information and the more impact through the open access uh, model. So we can see the citation trend in terms of mean per number of the citation different points in time uh, growth. So uh, then also the number of percentage of all open access articles indexed from academic and scientific uh, journal from 2075 to 2018, we can see this uh, uh, rise of the, the these um, these articles. Of course, I can share this presentation with you later, and you can uh, double check all those uh, data. Uh, and uh, at the end, I'll give this uh, brief introduction with, within the MDPI. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, three thousand three hundred eighty one peer review journals so far far in open access. Uh, uh, Two hundred five. Uh, MDPI journals are currently covered in Web of Science. Uh, 93 uh, MDPI journals are cu currently covered in C list. Uh, two, uh, two, in 222, we have 11,050 papers published uh, so far in uh, our journals. Uh, these are the graphics uh, that shows that the MDPI is uh, on the top top of the list of the 10 publishers by number of articles published. Uh, and it's on the third place, the place where the Elsevier is the first place, Springer is the Springer Nature is the second one, and the MDPI uh, is on the third place. Uh, but when we talk about the, uh, the number of open access articles published, MDPI is uh, at the first place. So we can say that MDPI is the, the largest purely open access publishers according to the number of uh, published papers. Uh, we are in the top five largest academic publishers uh, worldwide. Uh, the most important feature of the MDPI is speed of publication. And I should mention that all of these uh, manuscripts are supported by staff member for each paper. So we have a bunch of people, group of people working on each paper to be published. And of course, uh, driven by values and service uh, quality. Okay, so <clears throat> MDPI values, I will say it's open access, flexibility, sustainability, sustainability, uh, timeless and efficiency, simplicity, high quality service. Uh, let's go through the MDPI philosophy shortly. Uh, what is important for us is fast and fair peer review and fair publication service cost. Uh, fast dissemination to research in order to allow, to allow everybody to fast access uh, published work. Uh, any valid sound research should be published, including negative results. Also, the significance of any article should not be judged only by two reviewers and editor, but the community at large. And of course, we do not boost the factor except through post-publication article uh, promotion. Seeing the future of MDPI, so uh, continue investment, innovation, and service for the research community. Continue focus on the author experience, first of all. Launch and development of journals in the new and emerging areas of research. A focus on supporting societies and association via journal partnership and affiliation. And a focus on a great openness through the research workflow, uh, preprints, open reviews, open data, and so on. So at the end, I would like to conclude that our mission is to promote scientific exchange through the scholarly open access journals and scientific communication projects. Uh, at the end, these are the links that you can find additional information about the MDPI and our journals. And uh, thank you so much for your attention uh, at this matter. All right, thank you so much, Neda. Thank you for your sharing. And could you please uh, stop the sharing with us? We have several questions on the question box as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can stop the sharing. Uh, I think the first one is, hello, Neda, can I ask if all the paper in DPI is open access and have article processing fee? Thank you. Sure, just let me go to the question. Uh, uh, yeah. The article processing fees. 
uh yes all the the general cnn api is open access and uh, all of them have article processing fees but i would like to uh, to mention that we have this waiver policy so uh, everyone can apply for the waiver and we have those uh, opportunities to publish uh, a bunch of manuscripts with the the discounts all right thank you let's move on to the second one he said who will be the first one to check the submission is the editor-in-chief thank you uh, the first one to check edition will be the editorial board member, or in the case when the manuscript is sub, sub, uh, submitted in the special issue, it will be the guest editor. So usually we have this double check also by the guest editor and the editorial board member. And of course, if we need the third opinion, it's usually escalate to the editor-in-chief level. All right, thank you. And uh, we have the one he said, will the drop in 2021 continue? In 2022, I guess this is what he's meaning. Uh, will the drop, in, uh, we are not sure. Let's see how yeah. it's uh, finished this year and then we'll get up with this new data and uh, with that we can comment uh, the results. All right, thank you. And we have the last one. I would say that media press may be one of the encouraging factor that open access model. <laughs> maybe one uh, might be so uh, <laughs> i definitely needs more more marketing and media but uh, i would say that the word has to be spread so i guess it's a great tool to to spread the word about open access and uh, the work at all all right thank you so much Neda. And our presentation and Q&A part is over now. And uh, we encourage all the audience join us for our roundtable session and to discuss the topics about, about open access issue. And uh, we have several issues we would like to discuss about. And uh, first, let me introduce and uh, let me invite our speakers to answer some of them. And can I ask uh, Dr. Roger Jones? And do you want to answer the first one? How do you understand the theme of open for climate justice uh, for this International Open Access Week? Um, I actually thought it, thought it was a good. It's a good topic to discuss. Um, <laughs> And, and I think partly because both of us mentioned that it's actually, it's difficult to come to grips with, but it's actually a really important topic. And um, I think it's one of those where there's, you know, nothing is fixed and nothing is firm. Um, it's also very important for inclusion. So um, the people who uh, are disadvantaged, particularly by institutional structures, um it's it's very important to give more people a voice to give more people access and I, you know i think and as i i do a lot of reviewing and, and a, a lot of editing and it's it's often um landed on my desk i'm not quite sure why who's um people who want to publish whose first language is not not english necessarily but they're publishing in english and i don't think people should be um, should be penalised, uh, you know, so often do quite a lot of work in, in trying to make, if you can see that the work is good uh, and it has good quality, it should be supported to publishing. So um, I think, you know, acting out climate justice or any kind of justice in terms of environment and access and everything like that is very important um, for the bigger picture. It's important to do the small things and the big things. All right, thank you so much, Professor Jones. And I would like to invite Neda for the second question. What do you think of the open access model? Yeah, could you please uh, explain them from MDPI side? Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, Lori. So uh, obviously, I think that open access is absolutely necessary. So uh, it's part of the development in our society regarding transparency, accessibility of information, democratization information. So uh, distribution of scientific research in a, just a bigger and larger way uh, is uh, through open access and through the subscription journals. 
from my opinion. And uh, of course, what I found really useful and uh, important is that uh, all non-academics who want to access the information, especially in the medicine uh, uh, scientific field, uh, they can use all those information research uh, that was not possible previously through the subscription journals. And of course, according to the research, uh, according to the, the scientific research, the open access publication is strongly associated with the modern digital communications, which stands out from the old fashioned uh, paper, paper based system. So uh, that's that's my opinion. All right, thank you so much, Neda. And we have the final question. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Jack Helius. Uh, could you please answer this question for us? Um, how do you think of the development trend of open access in the academic? Of course, there is no doubt uh, that uh, there is a positive uh, effect. Well, the question was, uh, what do you think about the de development? Trend. Yeah, you got the trend. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, um, positive trend is always welcome. Uh, what worries me a little bit is uh, about um, the big number of uh, articles and papers on the same uh, same theme. I mean, <clears throat> duplication is difficult to avoid in this open access, uh, say, uh, activity because of the copyright uh, transfer. And um, for example, in order to be informed uh, in, open, in open access uh, results, you are flooded <coughs> by a number of articles. And sometimes you cannot get the right information at uh, the right moment. Uh, so this is a kind of quantity versus quality. Of course, quality must be one of the objectives when you, you make the assessment and uh, uh, the cri crit critically, say, reviewing uh, a paper. But still, I think uh, there is um, an effort to make in order to put all these uh, results in uh, categories and uh, not having overlapping and uh, uh, some, uh, say, um, difficulty in um, reading them. All right, thank you so much. And if our audience, you have something to share with us, please raise up your hand. And during the time while you are thinking, and Neda, uh, we have uh, three more questions. I can check in the question box. I think uh, it's from Dr. Julius. He's asking about special issue. Uh, thanks, Laurie. Yes, I see it. So we are concerned that the sustainability journal evolution will not continue with, uh, I think it's special issue. Special yeah. issue. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. So uh, I would like to say that at the moment we have so many uh, of new rules and the policy changing in the, our journals. I, I think in the MPPI in general, but the, the journal sustainability uh, special. So I think there's a process of the business and evolution of the business where you're going with the flow and then by uh, doing the things you're seeing what is right, what is wrong and trying to improve your work and uh, uh, continue that way. So for now, we will for sure continue working on special issues. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we are stopping uh, the large number of opening the special issues and paying more attention to hot topics and uh, having uh, better, uh, I, will, I will say, quality of the special issues. So definitely there are some changes, but we will continue continue this, this work. All right. Thank you so much, Neda. Thank you for your answer. And if our audience, we do not have more to discussion, I think that is enough for today. Uh, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to all the speakers, yeah. Professor Gelias, Professor Jones, and uh, Neda uh, for your wonderful speech and for answering so many questions for us. And I would like to thank all the audience. Uh, please do remember we have another uh, webinar on the 26th. Uh, this month and we will show us the inside of Open Access Week as well. And I think that's enough for today. I would like to end it for now. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your precious time sharing with us. Thank you so much. Okay. I will end this meeting for all now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.